Coming to you by way of the not-for-profit Mainframe Art Studios at 900 Keogh Way in downtown Des Moines, this is 900 Views, a podcast about building community through the arts as we build an arts community. I'm your host, Pat Bode, and today I'm in the heart of historic Valley Junction in West Des Moines at Olson Larson Galleries. Olson Larson's roots include Jan Shotwell's gallery, established in 1970 as one of the first in central Iowa to promote regional and local artists. Shotwell's gallery was purchased nine years later by Ann Larson and Marlene Olson. Susan Watts took over in 2010 after serving as manager under Marlene for seven years. Elise Vernon now serves as gallery manager for Susan, and both are joining me today for this program. Olson Larson is a contemporary gallery representing 60 professional Midwestern artists, including Lee Running, a mainframe artist and recent guest on this program, and many other artists we hope to talk to down the line. Many of these artists are recognized as among the best in their fields, and most live in Iowa or have strong Midwest connections. Now, beginning October 11th and running through all of November, Susan Watts and Elise Vernon will exhibit women's work. And let's begin with our guests telling us a little bit about why this exhibit and why now. Susan? Hello. Well, the impetus for the show came from strongly from Elise. Um, we get together and try to figure out our shows for the year. Uh, Mark Goodrich, Elise, and I just brainstorm. And Elise and I were talking about a group show with some sort of theme, which we like to do about once a year. Um, so there are so many wonderful women artists in our stable, plus there are other artists that um, often we, with group shows we have invited artists. So we had come across a few others, both in our individual travels and via the gallery that we thought would would work in this show. Of course, we had about three times as many artists probably that we could include in the show, but we narrowed it down to eight. <laughs> to so, eight? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, I'll pass it off to Elise now to tell you a little bit more about the show. So the show will include three of the artists that we, three female artists that we represent here and the rest of the artists we do not represent. Like Susan said, we invited them to participate in the show. Yeah, and it, give me a feel for what it's like. I mean, the women's work, are we seeing Rosie the Riveter? What's going to happen here? <laughs> yeah, we. that's something we definitely thought about Um in kind of the theme and media and things like that that these women are working in it's not necessarily um, aimed at female empowerment in their work but just the aim of representing these women who are doing fantastic work whatever it may be um, who may not you know get traditional representation, if that makes sense. Well, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by traditional representation. I mean, when I think a lot of folks don't necessarily understand the role of gallery in uh, looking at the arts community and the arts scene here. Can you tell me a little bit about like, who's the actual client, the artist or someone who's buying? How does this kind of all work? Well, that's funny because sometimes I say I have a lot of bosses being both <laughs> artists and clients. Um, so we represent, like you said, about 60 artists. And by the word represent, that means we have their work here on consignment and they are exclusive with us in central Iowa. And so if we sell something of theirs, then we get a cut. And our job is to promote our artists as best we possibly can and get them out there as best we possibly can. So when Elise refers to traditional representation, the, the gallery role has changed with the internet. Oh, okay. Tell me more. <laughs> so the internet is a great tool for us because we have a beautiful website and Elise does all these wonderful social media posts so we can get images and our artist names out there and all the wonderful things they're doing. But at the same time, it's easier for artists to get themselves out there. So they're not as reliant on galleries as they have been in the past. So we, we are, I feel like we're often shifting and, you know, so 
I've been here a total of 16 years and that has changed immensely since, um, since I started. So back to the original question, traditional representation, a lot of artists right now, um, especially are, are just, um, putting themselves out there and getting, since the communication is so much easier, which is great. Like there's, you know, we, our role is, is to support the artists and that's our, you know, that's, of course we want to pay our bills and <laughs> yeah. get our artwork out there and get our artists out there. So how have you been adjusting and shifting as the social media has come online and more and more artists are kind of doing some level of self-representation? Right. How, how have you changed? What do you do differently today? Our social media presence has been, um, it, it's, it, the last couple of years, it's spiked because Elisa, that's one of the main things when I hired her, I asked her to really bolster that. Mm-hmm. And she's done it with, in spades. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you used yeah. social media to actually uh, well, uh, facilitate and maybe enhance traditional representation? Yeah. So like Susan was saying, a lot of artists now do a good job of promoting themselves. So I kind of take that... Um, and run with it a little bit. So it's a little bit easier for us to uh, share our artists work if they already have a social media presence. And so the posts that I'm able to share content or tag people or, you know, cross promote as much as possible, those are the posts and the artwork and the information that goes the furthest. So that's really helpful. So when you look at your criteria for selecting artists uh, to work with, to what extent is their capacity at marketing and promotion part of the mix versus the actual art product itself? Um, I I think Susan would agree with me that that's a larger part of it now than it used to be. Um, Yeah, that's something we definitely look at. So you're looking not just at the results, but at how they work as business people and marketing people in this world. Yeah, and a a lot of it is about how, um, I mean, we think about how we represent ourselves and how we represent our artists. So we look at how how artists represent themselves and their work. And, you know, that's, it's all consideration. So you've got this little tagline you use. Uh, It says, I believe, I'm, I'm trying to locate it here in my notes. It's three phrases here. See art. No art, by art. Yes. That sounds like a bit of a continuum. And where is the drag in that continuum? Is it getting people to see art? Is it getting people to know art? Or is it getting people to buy art? And, you, and you're giggling over this. I don't know if you can hear it on the microphone or not. <laughs> so that came from a kind of a marketing push we did. Oh, not too long after I took over and I had seen this bumper sticker somewhere and it just said buy art. And I thought that was so fantastic. So I just kept thinking about that and thinking about it. And when we, you know, after I took over, I didn't rebrand per se, but we did do a little bit of different marketing. We kind of punched up some colors that we were using and we printed um, some literature with this information. So I, I saw it as, that you know that's that's who we are we want people to see art so we put art on the walls and we put art in places and make it look wonderful we want people to know art because part of my background and my passion is to educate people about art i've always loved doing that i have an art history degree i was in education work in the um, art center that i worked at before i worked at the gallery and that is our, I feel like that's our role in the community. Sure, we're a retail gallery, but it's, we put on symposia, we do artist lectures, we serve on boards. That's what makes everything work. If we didn't do that, we couldn't do the other things we were doing. And I'm very glad that my coworkers share that with me. You know, Elise is very involved in the art world as is Mark. So that's where, that's where that continuum goes <laughs> yeah so it doesn't really drag it down but it's something you really have to focus on is this education yes. around art yes and, and, and is that a something uh, of particular need in a mid-sized midwestern community like Des Moines versus if we were in Chicago LA or New York 
Yes. And again, probably more so 15, 20 years ago, as you know, our landscape has changed drastically, I would say, in the last 20 years. I mean, I, I think Des Moines has always been a strong art community, but it's it's getting better by leaps and bounds. Um, and I just don't, I think anywhere you are, the more education, the better about no matter what. And it's, it's, it's funny because we we have people that come see us that live in bigger cities and I can't believe all your artists are Midwestern. That's so great. You know, and things like that. And so it's just, that's an, a, another layer of the educating that we do is, you know, that the stigma about the Midwest, which, you know, that there's not a whole lot happening here. There's incredible things happening here. So that's another part of the education as well. And then my job is to get the word out. <laughs> and tell people, hey, look at this cool stuff we're doing. And look at this cool stuff that our artists are doing. And, you know, here's some more information about it. Learn and let us help you learn and know these cool things. So is it translating into the buy art part of that three-stepped process? We like to think so. <laughs> but is it really... Yes, it is. And an yet another layer, so many layers, is the framing part of our business, which is a big part of our business. We educate about framing as well. Like, ah. for instance, last year we did a uh, print club. The Dwayne Art Center Print Club had a meeting here. And it was so fun because there were all these people in the gallery that are so fascinated by works on paper and they themselves collect all these wonderful pieces and a lot of them fortunately bring them here to frame and Mark has been framing for a hundred years and he's seen <laughs> everything. He yeah. You know, he, and he's very, very good at his job. And so he did this kind of, um, educational, uh, lecture uh, for lack of a better term and demonstration about preserving works on paper and how important it is and how to do it. And, you know, archival framing versus non-archival and quality versus, you know, trying to get the best deal and what that'll do to your piece over time. So a lot of what we do is educating people about that as well. So that I would say has, we've always had a very strong framing um, income stream, but I think that just keeps getting better as we, as we educate people about it. So that's one of the things that keeps you going and keeps you sustainable yeah. is, this, is this framing piece. I kind of want to go back to this Midwest stigma piece a, a, a little bit. Oh, go on. You had no, something no, no. else you go want ahead. to add, Susan? No, go oh, ahead. Okay, well, I want to understand what distinguishes Midwest artists from other artists. Uh, you focus on Midwest artists. Why? And what is the power in that? And what's the drawbacks to that? So the why harkens back to when the gallery opened with Jan Shotwell. She was one of the first galleries here in town to represent local artists. And when Marlene and Anne took over the gallery, they thought that was important. So they continued on with that niche. Same when I took over the gallery. Um, in terms of the power and the drawbacks, I'd say that the the artists in our stable a lot of them don't have the arena to, to a larger city arena to yeah. get their work out there some do but not all of them do yeah. so i feel like we are a good place for them to sometimes start their careers or or expand. get a mid career expand and you know to our earlier point about social media it's you know it's easier and easier to get things out um the drawbacks are i think sometimes you know a gallery in des moines might get dismissed for a national project you know because we sometimes we apply for calls public art calls mm -hmm. or you know um kansas city might have a hospital that they're building and they put out a call and will apply things like that maybe and because I'm not, of that stigma in yeah, part. yeah 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 I would say that would be a drawback um which I think you know happens a lot with a lot of different um arenas in the midwest you know that you get looked over because 
or overlooked because we're flyover zone right which is silly and we all know that's silly Mm -hmm. but um yeah so those are the those are the two points i see what are you what are you able to do to help counter that and help these artists then kind of overcome the stigma that's sort of attached to them from having a midwest base they're looking at each other and their eyes are getting very big (laughs) You want to get that one. So there's got to be something you're on to to be successful here besides framing. Okay. Besides, well, yes. So, <laughs> you know, the thing is, we have the most incredible people. You know, I mean, we don't, we're very, the foundation is strong. That's a great way to put it, Elise. And we're very picky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we, you know, I, we try to be, you know, as democratic as we can and, and, I want to give every artist a chance if I could. It's like you, but you can't. So we have to be the most realistic about our capacity, both physical capacity and capacity of, you know, managing an artist. There's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. When you get the cream, if I hear you right, you're telling me when you get the cream of the crop that's around, it doesn't really matter where you're from. Yes. You've got the creme de la creme. And so people should be paying some level of attention. Yes. So the fact that you're offering quality when you do get a chance helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I am, I am fully confident that we can stack up against anyone. And that's why it's, it's just, it's fun for me to hear when people, like I said, when they come back to visit or they're in town for this or that, and they're like, whoa, this place. Wow, this is great. Well, yeah, of course it is. You know, um, so anyway. And you say that's kind of been changing over time um, and getting a little bit easier. Part of that social media, but what's happening within this community that is kind of building up our arts reputation in your view? I'm sure Elise will have some comment on this as she is a transplant to here. Um, It's fun because I grew up here, so it's been so much fun just to see literally the physical landscape change and all the things happening arts-wise. But also just, I mean, I can't believe how many events there are all the time. And, you know, not all of our artists are local, as you mentioned, but we have a great core group of local artists that come to each other's openings and support each other. And we try to go as much as we can and support things. Um, there's I think, mainframe. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think there's, there's A, there's a lot of grassroots things happening that are really fun. A lot of events, a lot of pop-up things like that. Mainframe, I can't say enough about. Um, you know, Siobhan is a friend and she's doing incredible things there. And we have several artists represented that work there and friends. And we do work with community support advocates that has a studio there. So I think people are just doing more smaller events in addition to the great mainstays of the art center and the symphony and the ballet and things like that. I think that combination is just, is just, there's a ton of momentum with it. We've got a range of scales going on now. Is part of what you're saying. Yeah. And I think I, I'm just sort of echoing what Susan is saying, but I, I've lived in Des Moines for six years now. And just in that short time span, I feel like Des Moines as a city has grown a lot, but especially in the arts community, um, obviously mainframe is doing great things, um, and has a vibrant, um, kind of space within itself. But also me personally, I'm a photographer and I'm a part of a a lovely supportive um, critique group that meets every so often. And it's a wide range of different types of artists. Um, You know, men and women come together doing all sorts of different types of art and give each other feedback. So that's, you know, a community that you create for yourself and find the people that you connect with um, on that level. So it's, it's kind of helping you grow as an artist, but then also has a networking portion of it too. And again, like Susan said, we, we can't really go to all of the events because there are so many and it's fantastic. How did you find that group? And the reason I'm asking is because one of the things I've heard on this program multiple times is the challenge we have because we don't have a lot of formalized critique going on in this community and that that's one of our holes. Mm -hmm. Before I ask you what else is missing, uh, fill me in a little bit on how you captured your group that does do some critique that Mm -hmm. does help fill that hole. Yeah, so um, it was kind of just a snowball effect, a friend of a friend of a friend, and they um, 
I don't think I was a part of the core group that started it, but I was invited over time. And it was a friend I met um, who was also teaching photography workshops at the Des Moines Art Center. And that's how her and I connected. And then she found out about this other group and so on and so forth. So it just kind of builds, got, you know, sort of built over time, I guess. When you think about that arts community Mm -hmm. uh, and your role in it, uh, and other players' roles, what is sort of the stuff that we still need here? What are the things that are still missing? And it's it can be a pretty long list, I get that. Uh, so just do your best and give me some key highlights as to if you could make a change here in our arts scene, our arts community, what might be some of the top three to five things we should do differently? One thing that I see, and I think there's some improvement happening with it, like as we speak, is kind of a, tr- I don't want to say training, but education, s- educational something for professional artists, for artists that are seeking to be professional artists. And I'm sh- guessing you've probably heard that before. Not um, so much, really. Yes. And there's been a few um, things in the past. Can you give me an example of the kind of thing you're talking about there? So if I'm an artist coming out of grad school and I want to just give it a shot, there are, and I've, I've given a few talks that Iowa State on this to grad, grad students, things like that, but it's just kind of how, how to be a professional artist. So Ah. how to take really good photos of your work, you know, how to price your work, um, what kind of markets are you looking for, how to start out, um, you know, all the financial stuff, how, if you, if you are interested in gallery representation, how to approach that, how to work with your gallery, you know, I mean, there are so many different facets of being a professional artist and so many different paths. And I have heard from people that do have those advanced degrees in art that, Nobody taught us that. Nobody taught us that. So again, I think there's there's grumblings of some things happening um, on a larger scale, but that's my main thing that I see. That sounds like a potential fit for you guys. Yes. Yeah. We've we've we a long time ago with Metro Arts we hosted a thing here and it was great and it was so much fun. So anyway, that's the main thing I see in terms of a whole because, like I said, there are so many. There are so many great things happening and so much, the encouraging thing I see happening, I would say more so in the last five or six years is the support among artists Mm -hmm. of each other. Okay. So it's not people competing against each other and it's not, well, I'm an artist at this gallery, so I'm not going to hang out with you, you know, just kind of that kind of, no, honestly, you know, and so it's like, no, and, and I, and Elise has shown me some of this because she's part of these groups is really supporting each other and helping each other do different things and like here let's I've got to work on this grant while well, I'm working on the same grant let's work on it together that kind of the collaboration of thing. piece yeah 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 yes and the other thing I think is really exciting is the like the arts councils Iowa artist fellowship I mean that you know so some of the funding you know some of the funding has been challenged in the last several years as we know but finding ways around that and and other sources stepping up saying okay well here we get we need we need this to happen we need so, to support it financially yeah yeah so at least what else might be missing from your perspective um i think that i don't know that it's so much maybe it was a hole but i think it's being filled slowly um of again just kind of the types of groups that i have been mentioning critique group and things like that um it's very supportive and like Susan said not really in competition anymore um so that's that's a good feeling but it would be nice if that sort of idea of like okay I'm an artist working in my studio basement making these things and I don't know what to do with them are other people doing this yes the answer is yes (laughs) go find another person that is doing that too and go talk to them and and you don't have to cry alone in your basement because you think the stuff you're making is garbage. Like, don't do that. <laughs> okay. I hope folks are listening. I, I think that would be good. Uh, but I do want to get back to something that does kind of uh, make me want to explore it a little more. And it's back to the very beginning when I asked you sort of to what extent is this a capacity for self-promotion through social media a factor in your selection of the artists? And you said it, it, it is. 
I'd like to ask uh, kind of two questions at once. What other criteria are you looking for beyond the social media and the product itself? And then um, I'm just guessing that hearing the ability to self-promote and market might be an unsettling thing for some artists to hear. How would you provide them some level of comfort? So the criteria list more completely and comfort for those who might not like everything on that criteria list. Um, I, I'll hit on the, the last bit. Um, as as so I'm an artist, and if I know that a gallery that I'm looking to be represented by wants to know that I'm promoting my work, that scares me a lot because I'm terrible at promoting my own work. I'll promote other artists all day, but my own stuff, it's super terrifying. <laughs> okay, so that's upsetting. That didn't provide comfort. Um, I'm looking for comfort. Maybe there here, isn't I'm any. I'm here. I'm here for comfort. Uh, okay. What can you What can you tell me, Susan? We will help you. No, um, we, between the three of us, we have decades and decades of experience. And like Elise said, she will promote. She's a very good promoter. She has a great eye and she is good at seeking things out happening around the community. The criteria I'm most concerned with is, you know, the work that you're making, that you're serious about making work, uh, that you're a dedicated artist and that you're from the region. I mean, those are, you know, sure, if you have an awesome social media presence and we can just uh, cross promote all day, that's great. But if not, we can help you with that. Mm -hmm. And that's also what we're here for. So it, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword. <laughs> <laughs> There's a How's balancing that? act there I'm hearing. Yeah. If, 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 if I might fill in a blank here. Yes. You, the quality of the work still has to be at a certain level. It doesn't Absolutely. matter how well you promote yourself. Oh, oh, uh, yes. And and I, yeah, yes. And, you know, we always, with one exception, I always need to see the work in person before we sign someone, no matter how awesome the photography is and how, you know, which has changed over over um, the years as well. But it it always there's a difference in person. So we always wait. Sure. Okay. We identify someone if we see them, you know, online or if they email. Um, but we have to see the work in person before we officially bring them on. And I, like I said, I, I didn't do that. Um, one time, <laughs> <laughs> one and, time. And you never made that mistake yes. again. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we close here, and there's just so much more we could talk about, we might meet, need to do this again, because it's really uh, been been wonderful to, to hear. Uh, do you have this OL Guild, this Olson Larson Guild? It's a gas station, if you will, kind of uh, historically restored in, in some way. Julia Franklin's done work there. Molly Spain's done work there. It's clearly one of the pieces uh, of the mix that's a bit of a community builder. Um, I've gotten to talk to people personally who have filled that space and really saw its, its power. Talk to me about what inspired you to kind of keep that space in the way that you've kept it, allowing it to be used that way, and visit with me a little bit more about the role of the gallery as a community builder. Okay. The OL Guild is something that, speaking of Lee running, she was the kind of the impetus for it. So um, we had a show with her almost two years ago now here at the gallery, and she was showing Mark and I on this great installation she had just done with a friend of hers and was just taking it down in Nebraska. And both our eyes kind of lit up and thought, okay, there's some there's some spaces around here in Valley Junction. Maybe we could just put that up for the night because it was gallery night again. And long story short, the spaces that we planned on didn't work out and we're standing on Maple Street and Lee says, you know, I've always been interested in that funny little green building down there. Okay. So I called the landlord can we do this? Sure. So we were just, it was just going to be like for that night, but we had so much fun with it and we had such a great response that um, I went back to the, my landlord and said, how about we keep doing this? And she was tickled and she's a great art supporter and we, we have had so much fun with it, but beyond having fun with it, the important part and why it makes sense for us is many of the artist submissions we get or things that we see around town when we're out and about, it's gorgeous work, but it doesn't make sense in the traditional gallery setting. We can't hang it on a wall. We don't have the right niche for it. We don't have a space 
performance, uh, you know, it's, it, we can't make it work in here, but there's so much great work. So I saw it as an opportunity to display some of these wonderful things happening. And I can't tell you how much fun it is. Cause what we do, Pat, is we say, here's a key. <laughs> it has to be done by 4.55, the night of the opening. And we, we usually have a little idea. Yeah. And, you know, we usually kind of know where the artists are aware of the artists. We've invited artists in um, and just or more so happening lately is artists coming to us because it's it's getting it's momentum. So that's why it's important for us, because it's and, you know, on a marketing level as well, it brings in a different audience for us. You know, we've been around a long, long time. And so I think sometimes there's a stigma with us that we're kind of the old school gallery, but we're not. And I think that's a it's it's a way to bring in a different different set of eyes. I'll pass it over to Elise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what Susan said. Um, but I think at, like Susan said, a lot of our typical clientele tends to swing a little more mature. So one of my goals with the social media, with Instagram specifically, since it is such a visual platform, um, is to reach that younger crowd, people that are maybe more my age who might not have a ton of money to invest in art yet, um, but can, again, know art, see the art and know the art. Um, and so the OL Guild is a great, uh, fantastic venue for kind of reinforcing that idea um, because like Susan said it's kind of a different crowd coming into that space and sort of getting into our door in a different way so that's been nice so you're nurturing new collectors mm -hmm. are that's you really I mean is it working yes and I mean you know we are it's it it's another double-edged sword or a two-way street or however you want to say it it's it, it's important for the community. And so that's why we want to do it, but it doesn't hurt to have new eyes in here, you know? And so, I mean, I'll let you know in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a bit you of the strategy. I mean. It's yeah. part of the strategy it is to part do of that. The strategy. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, yeah. and so if these things have to happen over time, we had so much more to talk about and we're way out of time. Uh, this is so far the, the, the longest and yet fastest going, uh, interview I've gotten to do. So I can't thank Susan Watts and Elise Vernon enough. A reminder again, that women's work opens October 11th, which is also Valley Junction's fall gallery night and women's work will run through November 30th and mark your calendars ahead opening December 6th and up through February 1st will be the annual small works show here. Here. And at Mainframe on October 4th, a first Friday, Burn the Boats, an album released by Marqueas, a rapper and distiller, don't miss it. October 16th, Valerie Van Horn hosts River City Art and Music, another Riverview Arts Salon, this one at Mainframe. Many thanks to the folks at Mainframe Studios, the artists and director Siobhan Spain, and founder Justin Mandelbaum, who, with my collaborator, the wonderful Alex Cooney, make this program possible. Please consider subscribing to this podcast and sharing it with your friends. We can be found at 900views.com or as 900 Views Podcast. We're usually only 15 to 20 minutes in length, so treadmill length. This time you're going to get to be on your treadmill a long time. Thank you for listening, for supporting the arts, and your community. Mm -hmm.